morning, everyone. Can you hear me? So, uh, well, I mean, thanks for showing up this early. I mean, this is a kind of a really brutal time for a tutorial. So, um, but anyways, this, I hope that this is an interesting topic for you all. So, uh, yeah, as, as you heard, I mean, my name is Ville Tulas. I work at Adrol. By the way, I mean, like, Adrol will be having a booth here. Um, so if you want to learn more about what we are doing and like what we think about things and especially if you want to get one of these fine t-shirts You will be able to do that tomorrow somewhere here, I guess. So don't miss that opportunity So anyway, this is about TrailDB um, So first, I mean this is supposed to be a tutorial meaning that I mean this is kind of a I, I hope that this could be a more like an informal hands-on session rather than like just me speaking here like for an hour so and uh, oftentimes when I'm attending tutorials, I, I find them actually like a very slow. But I mean, uh, uh, but I mean in this case, actually, I, I wanted to kind of make sure that like you can you can really kind of uh, follow all the steps. So we are kind of going so on purpose. But if you feel that it's too slow, I mean, you can actually find these slides at this address. Um, so uh, they should be publicly available. So so feel free to kind of uh, fast forward and then start like hacking whatever you feel like. Uh, hopefully using TrailDB. And, and then like feel free to ask questions anytime. So I guess actually we do have the mic somewhere. So if you have any questions, I hope that like we can use the mic. And, um, and also uh, there's the, the main site for the project is at traildb.io. Feel free to go there. Uh, feel free to browse the documentation. And like if, if any questions come to your mind, I mean, you can, you can ask anytime about anything. So don't, don't feel bad about interrupting the flow of the presentation. So. And, and lastly, there's actually a, a, a jitter channel, like a chat channel, so um, that's going on uh, all the time. So, I mean, feel free to join that as well, so we can definitely continue chatting after this presentation as well, if you decide to try these things at home. Uh, what else? Oh, and there's a link to, to GitHub as well, so for the actual source code, of course. Um, but as I mentioned, I mean, this is supposed to be a hands-on tutorial, so uh, if you have a laptop, feel free to use it. But in any case, uh, I was planning to first spend maybe about, actually I can put the timer on, about mm -hmm. like maybe first like a 30 minutes, 20 minutes or so, just introducing you to TrailDB and like why we decided to do something like this in the first place. So it's always a good question that why you need something new. Okay, um, so um, TrailDB is an efficient tool for storing and querying series of events. So basically if, you, if we kind of uh, dissect this statement a bit, well, TrailDB, that's a nice name. An efficient tool, I, I really want to emphasize that this is a, a tool, I mean, one of the things that you can use in your toolbox in addition to all other tools that you have been using this far. So um, this is very, com I mean, at least we think that this is very complementary to, to many other tools that are out there. So, and I hope that like it will work uh, very well in, in conjunction with all the, all the other things. And then the next thing, the for storing and querying, obviously that kind of refers to the fact that it's kind of a database. So I mean, like this is about storing data and querying data. So that's that's kind of the, the theme of this presentation. Uh, but maybe the most interesting point about this statement is that it's really about very specific kind of data. So as I mentioned, I mean, it's supposed to be complementary. So in that sense, uh, of course, all of you probably have been using some kind of databases before, like relational databases, like MySQL and Postgres. Or, or maybe time series databases, or maybe key value databases. And um, the point about TrailDB is that it's kind of focusing on a slightly different set of data as I will be, as I will be presenting soon. So that's, that's kind of really important point. Um, and namely the kind of the data we are talking about today here is basically event data like this. So it, can, it could possibly come from many different sources, but um, one of the most typical source sources of for, for like event-based data like this is users, let's say users of, web, of your web service or users of your mobile application or, or any kind of users um, generating data and basically some kind of events, they do something. So this is like an example from a web analytics tool, Heap, very, very nice, very nice application that shows that there was one user actually using our dashboard at that role. Um, and in this case, you can see that the user generated a stream of events over time. So at like uh, 2.39 uh, a.m. they viewed the campaigns page, then they kept browsing the site, and then they kind of kept going to different parts of the site over, I guess, what's that? That's like over like a four minutes of time. So basically you get this series of events. So that's a very, very typical thing that you can collect from, from any kind of application. However, it doesn't always have to be about humans or like actual users generating data. It could be actual machines. 
Uh, like in this case, for instance, um, this is like our infrastructure monitoring from, from AWS, from Amazon Web Services. And you can see that there's one instance, one server generating a stream of events, so again, over, over some time, saying that actually in this case, very boringly, that everything is okay. But again, I mean, it's a series of events. And of course, I mean, to make this a bit more exciting, you could imagine that this could be like a massive, like a internet of things uh, set of like a tiny little sensor. So you could have a million sensors generating these tiny little events over time. So, so I mean, many, many interesting sources of data. Um, but the key thing, I mean, to note here uh, about the nature of this data is that, well, I mean, first, there's some kind of a, some kind of an entity, let it be user or a machine, generating the events. And then secondly, there are these like a discrete actions. So that's really a key point that like in this case, the, it's, it, this is not about like tracking, uh, let's say the stock price or like tracking temperature or anything continuous of that nature. But this is a, really about like those different like discrete actions, like, it, like in this case, this is actually again ad roll data showing that we, we record when people browse websites, we also show them ads, people click ads and so forth, but they are very distinct entities. So, so they can't be tracked in a, in a simple time series as easily as you can track, let's say, temperature or, or something of that kind. So that's, that's really kind of when I mentioned that TrailDB is, is complementary. So we feel that like kind of a, this very specific kind of data is something that could use more attention. And uh, I can maybe give you a bit more context that like why, why we decided to start doing this in the, in the first place. So, um, well, I mean, just to give you a very, like a, like a brief uh, introduction to, to what Adrol is doing. Adrol is an advertising technology company, meaning that we show people ads, uh, which is a, like, if you look at companies like Google and Facebook, that's a, that's a kind of a, obviously, a, like a very important service in the economy. But I mean, like, given the audience here, I mean, why it is especially interesting is that there's tons and tons of data involved. Um, since so it happens that in contrast to the days of Mad Men, uh, this is not about like having kind of a copywriter and a designer meeting with the, with the, with the companies and like to discuss about their branding, but this is solely about looking at the data and understanding from the data how we can actually show ads to the right people at the right time so they would actually end up buying something. So that's really the core of the business. So it's really, really all about data. And actually, like what you can see in this visualization here, um, is interestingly that that background noise, I mean, it's not just like a pretty background picture, although it is that as well, but it's actually a data visualization. So on the Y axis, um, we have different users, uh, actually like different people surfing the web. I mean, in this case, it's about like, a, if I remember correctly, about 200,000 different people kind of condensed in this single visualization. And on the X axis, we have time. So it's basically on the Y axis, you have users, on the X axis, you have time. And then it's kind of hard to see here, but they are actually different kind of colors. So they are like tiny little red dots uh, that are ads. So if people feel that like you see too many ads on the web, that possibly can't be true because it's really even hard to see the ads here because there are so few of them compared to everything else what's happening. Um, so it's very sparse. Also, I mean, you can actually, this is by the way, I mean, the x-axis is uh, 24 hours in the United States. So if you look really closely, you can see that there's that like a lighter, uh, like a, like a block in the, in the middle, uh, which is the kind of the night time in the United States, of course a bit smoothened by the different time zones. So people are surfing the, the web less actively. So then the gray dots, which is most of the data, are actually people browsing different sites, so they are page views. And the, and the green line that you can see is that like every night we actually get some data dumps from, from external partners, so that's kind of an interesting looking stripe. But basically, it is, as you can imagine, it, it is a lot of data, but I mean, when you, when you look at uh, this way, I mean, it's kind of hard to see that, okay, so is there any value in this? What's the point? I mean, it just seems like a cloud of dots. Um, but there's actually a very simple um, transformation that you can do. So if you just take the same data and you uh, sort the rows, so basically you just take this like a dot cloud, like a scatter plot, and then you just sort the, sort the rows or like you sort the y-axis, sort the users, what ends up happening and, um, and actually in this case, it's, it's also sorted by account. What ends up happening is that like these different kind of pattern emerge. emerge. So it's not like just a, like a uniform looking uh, random cloud of data, but actually there are all kinds of things that you can start seeing. And uh, like for instance, I mean, one thing that's really obvious that like different websites behave in very different ways. So you can see that there's that like a very dark uh, area 
uh, which like corresponds to the site where people are really, really engaged. They produce a lot of data at that site. In, in, in some other cases, it's totally opposite. And um, and like you can actually where's the pointer again? So um, actually, maybe it's easier. Uh, so you can actually see that there's this like a red area where you can start seeing that like there's like really some um, accounts that are actively showing ads to their customers. And um, and actually, like what is really really interesting also is that it's it's kind of hard to see here. Uh, it's like down there. You can actually see an area where people or kind of these presumed people never sleep. So in many other cases, you actually see that like there's less activity during night time. But in certain cases, you see that the same users keep bombarding, uh, producing data all the time. And actually, the reason for this is that these are not users at all. These are actual like bots. They are like there's like ad fraud. It's a huge issue in the industry, and like we are actively fighting against it. And and this is also an excellent way to detect like very anomalous like streams of events. So if something is behaving in a very strange way, you can usually start seeing it when when you look at it the data this way. So the point being that like for ad roll especially, um, and like actually I would claim that like for many other companies as well, and of course for many other like uh, fields of research as well, being able to look at this kind of a uh, series of discrete events and being able to analyze it efficiently is, is very much of a key question. And um, again, I mean, just to give you an idea of what kind of things we do in practice, so I mean, just to give you some background, so uh, like it was mentioned in the introduction, uh, this is an open source project that we open sourced last May, uh, but we have been actually using uh, TrailDB internally um, like for two years, so it's actually like powering products, it's, it's a real deal. And, and we are using it to, for instance, to um, produce basic web analytics, so you can actually easily do things like a bounce rate, you can see how, how, how uh, uh, like actively people stay at the site, but also more interestingly, you can start like a inferring this kind of a causal relationship between the ads and the actions people take, which kind of is the topic of, of like attribution models, how do you attribute the success of the ads to the actual um, ads campaigns. And then also, I mean, like I mentioned, the fraud detection, and then also we actually use these things to derive features for machine learning models. So that's actually a very interesting topic that, as you can imagine, um, when you are building predictive models, oftentimes it's very interesting that like you can consider time and you can actually derive different features over time. So that's another use case that we have had. But as I mentioned, I mean, TrailDB is a pretty generic tool. I mean, it's definitely not, not specific to advertising or anything like that. So I'm sure that like you, you may find even more interesting use cases for it. Um, now, if you if you look at this, and that's of course like a very high level. As I mentioned, it's like 24 hours over um, 200,000 users or so. Now, if you imagine that like you zoom in a bit, um, what you basically start seeing is that you, you you can like look at things at the at the level of individual users. Um, so again, I mean like the y-axis is, is users and the x-axis is time, and now these users are producing events, discrete events of different kinds. And in this case, they are just different colors. But, um, but the point is that there are events that happen over time. And now quite simply, I mean, that's, that's uh, in a way, I mean, all the TrailDB is. So we take this data and we package it in a, in a, in a very simple, very efficient file or library, uh, like, a, like a database file that allows you to slice and dice and query the data in different ways. And also, I mean, maybe like one, one more important point is that um, it's not only meant for analytics or, or like a data exploration, it's also meant to be a building block of actual production systems. So I will talk about this more a, a bit later, but I mean, we feel that it's also very important that the same tools that you, I guess many of you are data scientists, used to do this kind of um, exploratory and like uh, iterative um, development to develop the models and so forth, is this, you, you can actually use the very same tools in, in production as well. So that's, <clears throat> that's really kind of uh, the point. So I mean now, um, just to kind of go a bit, bit deeper and like maybe a bit more technical, about TrailDB. So, as I mentioned, I mean, it's a very simple data model. Um, the data model is based on the fact that we have a, a, some kind of a primary key, which is some kind of a user identifier. Again, I mean, it doesn't have to be a user, it could be a machine, whatever, but I mean, there's some kind of a primary key. Uh, and actually, in our case, uh, I don't know if by now, I mean, like you have checked the website or downloaded the code or something, um, you, you can see that like, just for convenience, we uh, assume that like the, the user ID is such as like a 16 byte UUIDs, um, but I mean, it's up to you. I mean, what do you want to use uh, use as the IDs? That seems to be a very, I mean, like a like flexible enough format. Um, so then like we have obviously these events, I mean, what happened and when, 
and then like importantly of course we have the history of events so that's the, that's kind of the whole point that like we have all these three components so we have the primary key to some user identifier we have the events and like that basically say that okay so what kind of schema what kind of structure we have for our data and then we have basically history of these things and just to put this in in a context i mean consider how this compares to other databases that you might have been using before so for instance, uh, if, you, if you think about like normal relational database like Postgres or MySQL or something like that, um, typically what you have is, is of course some kind of a primary key. Uh, you, you have your tables and the table may have the primary key. And actually even at Adderall we have a table called users and then there's of course the user ID as the primary key of the table. And, uh, and in that table we, we have a column that's called uh, last login date or something like that. And now every time the user logs in, we get an event saying that the user has logged in and we update the database, we update the Postgres database and the table to say that the last login date is whatever is the, is the timestamp of the latest event. But the key point here is that, um, of course, we lose the previous timestamp by doing this and this is the nature of, of traditional relational databases that you make these destructive updates. You keep modifying the user's email address, you keep modifying whatever, but I mean whatever it used to be the previous value gets lost. And of course it is quite possible to actually have a separate table maybe that stores the previous values, but um, that kind of requires extra work and that's really not kind of a, the very fundamental nature of relational databases. So, but I mean, as, as I mentioned, I mean, this TrailDB is very complementary, not meant to be, of course, like replacing relational databases, but really focusing a slightly different use case. Then uh, another very interesting type of database that maybe many of you have been using before is, is different kind of time series databases. So um, for instance, we at Adderall are using a, a tool called Datadog to monitor our infrastructure. And what it does is that it actually gets all these like a stream of events and um, it then produces a nice like time series chart like showing let's say CPU utilization or network consumption or something like that um, over a period of time. Uh, and in this case, again, I mean, you can imagine that you have a primary key that might be the, let's say, the server ID, the instance ID. And now you kind of get this history. I mean, you have the time series of, like, let's say, the past, like, one day or, like, a one month or whatever. Um, so in that sense, in this case, you, you have the history as well. But however, usually what happens with time series databases is that um, you... Um, oh that you uh, like aggregate the events. So instead of like storing every single event, every single recording of the CPU utilization every second, let's say you aggregate this, like what's the average CPU utilization over let's say one minute or one hour and so forth. So in that sense, you kind of lose some granularity by doing that, which is of course by design and totally fine. Um, but I mean, again, I'm a slightly different angle. And then finally, I mean, if you consider the case that like you basically just keep logging data uh, in log files, which is also something that we do at Adderall and maybe many of you do as well, you get the history, you get the, the, the very granular events. Um, but I mean, now of course, like querying data like this is, is quite tedious. So classically, many, many people may have been using MapReduce to, to run queries over log files and, and many other things like this. But, um, but I mean, it tends to be pretty expensive and, and, and not very convenient. So, um, but in any case, I mean, there are like surely many, many different ways of, of, of like storing data like this. So, so why we need anything new? I mean, just to give you some motivation, what, what TrailDB does differently? Um, well, I mean, I, I mean, I can just like, a, I'm happy to talk more about this, like maybe separately. I mean, this kind of a, like a passionate topic for me. But I mean, one thing is that uh, like developer productivity is a big deal. So. So for instance, Adderall is, is a smaller company. We have about like 50, 60 engineers. So uh, like productivity is, is a really big deal. Um, overall, I, I feel that like it really makes a really a qualitative uh, kind of a difference uh, when you are doing especially data related work. If, the, uh, if, if there's a very like a direct connection between what you are thinking and the ideas you might be getting and like the models and then the tools that you have so that the actual like the tools don't uh, impose any extra friction or like extra time delays or anything like that in your kind of a thought process. So, so overall, like we really want to have tools that like make us very productive and like don't hinder our thinking too much. So, you will see soon. I mean, how we are trying to accomplish that with with TrailDB. Um, another huge deal is that um, I don't know if you have noticed, but the world is changing. Uh, at least it has changed since yesterday. Uh, and it, in in a, in a more macro scale, uh, one big thing that's happening is that like more and more 
of computation and data related stuff is moving to the cloud, uh, which is of course something that has been happening for the past 10 years already. But uh, what's especially interesting, if you have been like, for instance, following the announcements made by Amazon Web Services over the past couple of years, is that even the servers are disappearing. So um, it used to be so that if you had a, like a MapReduce cluster, you had like a, actually we, like back in the day, we used to have like a actual, like a physical racks of machines crunching data and so forth. And then of course, and actually like we used to like rack and stack the machines by ourselves and, and that was kind of cool back in the day. But of course that's all past. I mean, I hope that like, no one has to do it anymore. Um, and the next phase was that like, well, you can launch these virtual servers in the cloud. And now you don't have to physically kind of uh, uh, like hurt your fingers by, by like racking and stacking the machines. And at least you can just click a button and get the server. But the thing is that you still get the server and, and you still have kind of a, like a cluster of servers running somewhere. And you have to worry about, the, about like how many servers you want and you want to have to worry about the types of servers and so forth. But actually, like, uh, like kind of what the, the, the direction where the world seems to be going is that actually you should be really focusing on the actual computation that you want to perform and not the servers at all. I mean, at the end of the day, if you, if you like, for instance, consider the typical things data scientists need to do, I mean, it's really, there's very little about the servers and, and like, much about the actual computation. And, and, like, how this is happening today is that, like, if you look at, like, Docker, how much you can like just package as Docker containers without having to worry about the, the host machine or, or especially something like M Amazon Lambda that allows you to just specify the function that you want to execute and, and like they will give you a place to execute that function. And now um, just quickly to give you some idea why, why this is relevant to TrailDB is that um, so it happens that like most of the um, most of the kind of the classical databases are based on the idea that you have some kind of a very like a concrete infrastructure. You may have like a database server or maybe you have a cluster of database servers. And even like a more modern like a key value storage is like let's say Cassandra or HBase or something like that are based on the idea that um, you have some kind of a cluster that's running this distributed, distributed database. But like if you don't have to worry about clusters of any kind uh, of like, a, like a, some fixed size for your computation, why, sh why should you worry about that for your, for your data? Either. So the, the idea with the TrailDB is that like maybe the, the mindset could change so that like you, you store these pieces of data efficiently, you put them somewhere in the cloud, you have these functions that perform the computation like on the pieces of data that you care about, and, and like kind of the idea of having some kind of database machines is, isn't that relevant anymore. Um, and then lastly, uh, I mean, another big trend uh, which you may have seen happening in the database world um, overall, I mean, like in the data tooling world as well, is that like kind of uh, you want to focus on a, on a certain domain. It's very hard to have like a one size fits all universal solutions. Actually, it's, it's oftentimes you get like a nicer tools um, when you really focus on one, one use case. And like that's, of course, what TrailDB is doing. I mean, by no means this is trying to solve all problems. We are focusing on one, one very simple case, and it actually allows us to really solve that one case, hopefully better than many other more generic solutions. And then, uh, like, really, I mean, going under the hood, and like, maybe this is the main point why you should be interested about this, I mean, in technical sense, is that TrailDB is really based on the idea that you can compress the data well. And um, why it is especially interesting, of course, many, there are many other tools out there these days, um, especially in the world of columnar databases that allow you to compress data well. Well, so it happens that especially data of this kind of where you imagine that uh, the visualization of having the, the users on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis makes it um, more easy to compress data like even more efficiently than what you are able to do otherwise. So um, just to kind of give you some idea what it means is that, as you may know, there's actually like a very um, interesting, very fundamental connection actually between probability theory, information theory, and, uh, and then compression. I mean, that's they're actually like two sides of the same coin. So the whole point actually, like going back here maybe, the whole point of compression is that you are able to predict. And if your data is, is totally uniform and you can't understand anything about the data, or in the, in the extreme, if it's really like um, produced by a, a, like some kind of fundamentally random process, I mean, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you can't compress data of that kind. However, if your data is more predictable, like in this case, you can see that in some cases, if we know the account ID, we know that these users are more active. Or in some other cases, if we know that this account is, let's say, based in, 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 in Sweden, and, and they are browsing Swedish sites, we can actually leverage this to compress data better. So, 
This is like really the kind of the, the key point that we can actually take advantage of the fact that users are predictable. We can take advantage of the fact that things are predictable in time. If you look at the short period of time, I mean, people behave in a, or like any kind of entities behave in a, in a pretty kind of consistent manner, at least for a shorter period of time. And also in, in other way around, I mean, there's just some things in the world that are way more popular than others. So if you think of a concrete use case of like, uh, uh, like, uh, like looking at the web behavior, I mean, it's way more likely that any one of you actually go to youtube.com than let's say adderall.com. So we know that like YouTube is a, is a more popular thing. And again, I mean, we can leverage that in, in compression. And um, then, of course, well, I mean, this is what all compression techniques do. I mean, this is exactly what, like, a ZZIP does and, and, and so forth. Uh, but, like, why, why this is especially relevant for TrailDB is that um, it, like, what TrailDB does allows you to compress the data and actually perform interesting computation and querying on the compressed data itself without you having to decompress something first. And, and why this is important, um, it, is, it is really about, about speed. So there is, again, I mean, there's, of course, this kind of a classical, like, um, um, space-time trade-off and, and the fact that, like, the amount of data that you can push through a, a, a let's say, CPU core is, is, is limited. And so, but, I mean, it means that that's only about data. Um, so if you can condense your information in, in a smaller amount of bytes, you can actually do more computation in, in a time unit. So this is, this is actually, a, uh, uh, funnily enough, this is a, a, a picture from a presentation that I gave at the last Pi Data here in San Francisco, or it was at Facebook last time, 2014. Um, and um, I mean, just to give you an idea, uh, what this shows is that on the y-axis, we have the number of integer operations that the CPU is performing by microsecond. And then on the, on the x-axis, you have basically kind of, a, let's say that you have some kind of a vector of certain size of kilobytes. And now what it shows you, I mean, this kind of for illustrative purposes, what it shows you is that um, if your data is small enough, like in this case, let's say 10 megabytes or so, that it fits in like a L3 cache of the CPU, you can actually do amazing amount of computation. You can, let's say, go like do like a, whatever, 3.7 um, uh, like a giga operations per, per second. Uh, uh, yeah, per second. And, uh, but I mean, what happens if, let's say, your data isn't quite as efficiently encoded, so if there's, let's say, more redundancy and so forth, it just happens to be bigger, uh, and it doesn't fit in the cache, and there's some extra delay caused by the fact that the CPU has to fetch data from, from RAM, well, I mean, you kind of lose some efficiency. I mean, like, you, whatever is the drop, it goes from, like, a 3,700 to 2,500 or so. Yeah, please. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, Oh yeah, so yeah, actually, sorry, let, let me repeat the question. So the question is about the, whether the compression is based on a fixed sliding window. So there are actually not, like a number of different things that we do. Um, it is not exactly based on a, a fixed sliding window. So what you can do is that like first, um, I mean, maybe it's easier to explain after like going a bit more in detail, but the idea is that like we can look at basically like, a, if you know, like basic front length encoding. So I mean, if the same person keeps doing the same thing. I mean, however, often that happens, um, we can just compress that very efficiently. And, um, and then actually we also compress the other way around, like I mentioned on the, along the, the Y axis. So if many people keep doing the same thing, but, um, but it's, a, it's a great question. And maybe in the end of the talk, we can, we can talk more about the details. And actually, if you're curious, you can go to the Trail DPIO website and there's a slightly longer description about what, what, what it, how it actually works. Um, so anyway, so back to this. So, so yeah, so if, if, if the data is a bit bigger and like you, uh, you have to go in, in RAM, I mean, then it's gonna be kind of a, a bit less efficient. And of course, I mean, in the, in the kind of the worst case, if, if your data is bigger than what, what fits in RAM and like you have to fetch it from local disk or, or God forbid, I mean, you have to do some network operations. I mean, then it's almost like game over and like you, you have lost all performance. So, so compression is a big deal. I mean, not only for, for, for space, but also for time, which of course time corresponds to productivity. So you don't have to wait so long. So that's nice. So, um, okay, so now we are like trying to get to the, I, I promise that this will be more hands-on soon. Uh, so what is TrailDB in practice? So first, I mean, it's a, it's a very simple file. So you get the file. So, I mean, it's actually like really, again, I mean, going back to the idea of simplicity, simplicity and, and productivity. So, I mean, actually, I really like files, especially immutable, read-only files. They are very simple to handle. You can put them on a USB stick and give to your friend, or you can upload them in Amazon S3 and like, it's, it's very easy to reason about. Uh, what is important um, 
is that like TrailDB, is, as I mentioned in the first slide, it, it is really a library. The library is actually implemented in C for performance reasons. Uh, but I mean, in this sense, it's more like something like SQLite or, or many other embedded databases. Maybe you have used LevelDB. Um, and, but I mean, very different from Postgres or Redis that are kind of some like a standalone services that sit somewhere and like you connect them to like uh, some network protocol. Um, and then so basically like the idea is that the, the TrailDB is, is way more connected to your application than these other databases. And again, I mean, I hear my mention, it's, it's really a read only, this is a big deal. Uh, so which means that you can create these things, you can read these things, but it, like you can't ever change these things. And uh, I mean, this may seem uh, radical. There are many good reasons for doing this. Um, one is that like actually for a type of data analysis that we do actually, this, is, this isn't that much of a, that much of an issue since um, if you think that like we actually do want to analyze all the historical data, well, I mean, you could argue that whatever happened in the past can't change anyways. I mean, the history doesn't change. So in this sense, you can kind of, you can keep recording history, you can keep archiving history, and, and like then you analyze whatever happened in the past, but you don't have to change what happened in the past. Of course, you just need to keep appending stuff, what's happening right now. Um, so, and, and going back to the point of like the, the immutability, uh, it's also related to productivity as well. So if you consider in Python, these like three different statements, if you saw this line of code somewhere. So if you see the first line, I'm pretty sure that like, uh, like in the Python shell, all of you know that like what would be the result. In the second case, uh, it's harder to know, um, but I mean, you can probably figure out quite easily that like what's, I mean, you can like just print A and print B and then you can like find out what, what should be the result. Uh, but I mean, in the last case, like when you have some random functions and the functions may be calling Google or, or Facebook and you have no idea what's going inside, I mean, that's very hard to reason about. And especially they are not idempotent in the sense that like you may get a different result every time you call these functions. So again, I mean, it's, it's very hard to know actually like, like build systems around this idea of, of like constant like mutations. So. Immutability is also a big win in the, in the productivity point of view because when you know that let's say you have a trail DB and, and like it contains a set of data, it won't change. I mean, if you kind of imagine something like reproducible research, I mean, you can kind of store the, the data of, of your study in, in a trail DB and you can share it with everybody and like basically you can take the MD5 hash or whatever of the data and it really won't change. And that's actually surprisingly convenient. Um, Another thing is that uh, this is, of course, the Python conference, so we are focusing on Python here. Uh, but in, in practice, actually, um, we do have many other language bindings for TrailDB as well, so you don't have to use Python. And actually, in, in many cases, there are good reasons to know. I mean, like, this is, of course, like maybe blasphemy in this conference, but I mean, there are good reasons not to use Python in some cases. Uh, we support R. Actually, we support D. I mean, I don't know if anyone cares here, but I mean, D is actually a surprisingly nice language for low level, uh, like a high abstraction programming. Obviously C, uh, there's even like a Haskell binding and, and Go these days as well. So many, many different choices. And actually like Adderall is crazy enough to use many of these languages in production because so it happens that like, like uh, you want to use right tool for the shop and like uh, in different cases, it, it is really a, like justified to use something else than let's say Python always, or C. So that's that. Okay, so okay, so that was about the first 30 minutes. So uh, now um, you can actually, if you are curious enough, you can actually try it by yourself. Um, I mean, we, we can actually start by like, just like showing how, how you can install it. So uh, actually it should work on, um, uh, on OS X. So if you have a Mac laptop, laptop I mean, it should be okay. Um, also, uh, like different Linux distributions should work quite okay. Actually, as of yesterday night, I don't know if Oleg is here, but he told me that it <laughs> also works on Windows. So that's amazing. Um, so, um, okay, so what do you want to do if you are on OS X is that you want to open your shell and you want to do just, uh, if you are using Homebrew, so you can do just like a pre install trail DB. That's by far the easiest way to do it. Um, so actually I could, <clears throat> uh, so, actually, I, it's going to be, but it is really like literally what you want to do. Oh. Well, anyway, I have it installed, so, yeah. 
so I have it installed. So, um, so, but I mean, then once you do that, I mean, you get the TrailDB library. Now, the, the key point is that like we actually have the lan language binding separately. So this is just the just the library itself, and it also gives you this convenient command line tool called TDP. So you can use that to open open TrailDBs and so forth. So that's what you can do on uh, if you have Homebrew. Uh, then another option is that you can um, clone the GitHub repo. And then you can compile it from sources. It requires that you install a few additional packages. And then like actually, oh right, so I don't have connection here. But anyway, if you go to GitHub, um, you um, th there are like instructions what you need to do on on OS X to get it working. So by the way, if you have any any questions, we have like a few people here, uh, like Oleg and and Jared and and Greg who can who can help you also uh, if you need help installing it. So. It really shouldn't be too hard. Then on, on Linux, uh, it kind of it's it's maybe like a bit more tedious. So if we are using uh, like a Debian-based distribution or like Ubuntu, I mean you can just do um, apt get install and install the dependencies. There are like not too many dependencies, what it requires. So it actually uses libarchive, libgd, and a package config. So you want to do that, uh, or the same thing in in RPM-based distributions. And then like you want to clone it. And, uh, and then we are actually using this uh, build management system called WAF uh, to compile stuff. So you can just write WAF configure and WAF install or WAF build, and, and that should compile the whole thing. <clears throat> so it, it really shouldn't be too complicated since, I mean, it doesn't have too many dependencies and it's, it's rather a simple library. So, um, yeah, I mean, feel free to ask if you, if you have any, any questions there. Also, if you go to TrailDB.io, there's documentation and, and there's like a getting started section. And, uh, and it has the same steps. And uh, you can also, of course, uh, look at these slides. If I can remind you about the address. So if I uh, move forward too quickly, you can, you can go back in slides. So. So for this, um, for the examples, I'll be using Linux, but I mean it all should be working the same way on uh, OS X. So that's the installation. There's unfortunately like one small issue, at, especially for uh, Linux users, um, that um, we are using this very nice library uh, called uh, Judy Arrays. That's a very efficient, like a, like a mapping structure. Um, for, for C, unfortunately, I mean, it's kind of like a perfect data structure, uh, but because it's perfect, it hasn't been um, maintained for very actively. So um, if you happen to have a, like an old version of Ubuntu or something and it complains about the version being too old, uh, you need to fetch a newer, newer one uh, if you don't want to <coughs> upgrade your Linux distribution. So uh, for convenience, we are actually providing this library at the site since, I mean, this seems to be a frequently asked question. So you can actually just download the kind of the patched version of the library and you can replace the, the existing one with that library. Yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, are the Python bindings? Uh, yeah, uh, the question is about the Python 3 support. There's actually someone has been working on that. So, c good question. Um, so, let me know, I mean, like how it works with Python 3. We have been using 2.7. Um, I mean, there shouldn't be many things. I mean, mainly like related, of course, to string usage uh, that you may face, but yeah. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, kind of coming soon. Um, yeah, so that's that's about the installation. So then, like when you when you have the thing installed, what you can actually do is that there's a um, like a test trail DB included in the in the in the kind of the, the, the source repo. So it's called test. So I can show you. Um, so maybe here. So actually I have here, like, well, if we go to trail DB and we, let's say, just focus, I, I guess I have all kinds of things. But I mean, you should find in the trail DB report, there's a thing called um, test TDP. And it's just a very simple kind of a sanity check that everything works. So what we can do is that we can actually use this TDP command line tool to, um, to DDP dump, which basically shows you the contents, and you can give it dash i for the inputs, and you can say test, and you should see something like this. So if you have a, like a working installation 
um, especially if you have done just the pre-install on your OS X, um, and then you have cloned the GitHub repo, I mean, you should be able just to write this exact thing, and you should see something like this. Um, I mean, to make it a bit fancier, actually, what you can do is that you can like do dash J, and it gives you JSON, and then if you have one of the like typical JSON utilities on the command line, you can do JQ, and then you get this like a very pretty printed version of the same thing. Um, and um, so basically, this shows that it actually works. It's able to open the trail DB, and, and things are good. So hopefully, you are able to do that. I mean, feel free to ask if you have if you have trouble getting this far. Yeah. Uh, that probably means that like you are, it's not finding the, the, the library. So are you in the trail DB directory? So, so you may need to do the CD trail DB. Um, so it should be in the same, you should find this like a test.tdb in the directory where you are. Um, so I have, I have it here. And then when you do this, I think like if you, if you do something like that, yeah, I mean, then you get the error um, because it can't find it. I mean, it could be actually more descriptive, but yeah. Also, if you forget the dash i, you may get the same thing, right? So you want to have the dash i. Right, so anyway, so that's, that shows that your installation works. So maybe, Let's, let's move on to the next thing. So basically what you see here, uh, of course this looks, uh, let's see, the fancier version. This may not look like much, but I mean what you really see here is that like you see exactly the things that we have been talking about. So you have some kind of a user ID, um, you have some kind of a timestamp, and you have some event. Um, in this case, so basically this guy here is one event for, for this UUID for this user. I mean, it happened at this time, and it just happened to say hello world. Um, this is obviously dummy, dummy data, so I mean, nothing, nothing too interesting. Um, but I mean, it's really kind of showing things in this TrailDB format of the data model. Um, so now, um, kind of a, just seeing the hello world is, is very rewarding by itself. I mean, things work, so now we can actually start doing something slightly more interesting. So there's actually a, um, a, a, a kind of a slightly bigger trail DB that I created for this tutorial. So you can actually find it at this address. So if you just download that file, um, so it's trail DB IO slash data slash pi data dash tutorial dot TDB. Um, and you can actually then do the same thing. Leave it there for a minute. So um, it, what it actually contains is that uh, it has data from Wikipedia. So if you go to the, the, actually like, you don't have to do it now, but I mean like if you go to TrailDBIO and you uh, open the documentation and like there's also a tutorial, um, the tutorial is actually based on this Wikipedia data. So uh, interesting thing about Wikipedia is that they provide um, uh, historical logs of every single edit operation that, um, that has ever happened in the Wikipedia. So it's actually, it's a very interesting data set if you imagine like how Wikipedia has been evolving over time. And it's also a quite sizable data set. So I guess Wikipedia has been around for, I don't know, I mean, more than 10 years at least. And, uh, and they, of course, they have recorded everything. So if you actually like, there's, if you go to TrailDBIO and, and documentation, you can actually find a link to a TrailDB that's about 5.8 gigabytes. I didn't want you to download that because we would be probably like a, like a DDoSing the, the Wi-Fi here. Um, but um, this is a smaller version of, of the same data, a smaller sample of the Wikipedia data. But you can also download the full dump of all Wikipedia edits since, since, the, uh, since the beginning of time as one trail DB. And that one trail DB is 5.8 gigabytes. And why it is kind of interesting is that, um, as I can actually maybe show you now, the data we have here, if I do the Pi data tutorial, the data we have in this database looks like this. So basically you have some kind of a user identifier for the user who made the edit in Wikipedia. Then you have a timestamp for that edit. And then you have a title of the Wikipedia page where the edit operation happened. And then 
actually, uh, like at least in the past, Wikipedia allowed anybody to make edits without logging in. So we have a username for the user who made the edit. Uh, but I mean, in some cases, let's see if we have an example. I guess there are like just this one guy has been doing a lot. Mm, well, maybe. Kind of, yeah, well, I mean, like here. So you can actually see that like in the cases when we don't know the username of the, of the person who made the edit, we know the IP address. So there's either the username or we have the IP address. So we can do interesting things based on that. But the interesting thing is that there have been about like 600 million edit operations uh, in Wikipedia between I guess like 2000 something and then like I guess I did this last May, this is until last May or so. Um, so it's about 600 million events in the TrailDB and it's about 5.8 gigabytes which means that like we use about nine bytes to store each of these events. So I guess that speaks to, to the, kind of the, the kind of the efficiency of the compression that like we can store the title of the edit and we can store the IP address and we can store the username and the timestamp, which by itself is actually 64 bits or eight bytes um, in, in just nine bytes. So it is, it is actually surprisingly compressible and, and predictable. But it also means that, like, just think about it, that like you can uh, download, actually, you can really do it right now if you are curious enough, you can download the whole history of Wikipedia to your laptop. And if you happen to have eight gigabytes of RAM on your laptop, you can basically take the whole history of Wikipedia in the RAM of your machine and you can start doing all kinds of things with that data. And that's really amazing and that really relates to the question of productivity that like you don't need any, you don't need like a cluster of machines, you don't even need a server, you don't need anything fancy and you can start to start tinkering with the data, which is extremely powerful. Okay, so hopefully maybe by now, I mean like you have found this data set, so we will be using this for, for a few examples. Um, so, and I, just to kind of a, give a bit more light uh, about this concept. So basically, again, I mean, trail is a list of events, there's the unique ID. Um, so there are these different fields, so I can show you here. So you have the time and title and user and IP would be different fields and, um, and that those different fields basically which defines the schema of your data that, that defines one event. And every event has a timestamp and, and like every event relates to a single user but all the other fields are up to you. You can define them to be whatever you want but you have to define them when you are creating the trail DB. Okay. So, um, how do you how do you like make data of your own? So actually like if you happen to have um, some like like proprietary data or like data you have been using in the past, I mean you can definitely by all means use it. I mean to actually like follow follow the tutorial. So I mean it's actually quite simple. So uh, all you need is some kind of a, um, unordered stream of events. So I mean you don't have to do much any pre-processing beforehand. All you need is some kind of a uh, like user ID that you can use as the as the UUID and, and timestamp. Uh, Actually, like we are always using timestamps in the kind of the Unix timestamp format. It actually, it can be at like whatever granularity. It can be even like at the like a microsecond or millisecond level. It's up to you. Um, well, it needs to be 64 bits. But usually, I mean, you can just take the the, um, the second level Unix timestamp, and then you can you can have whatever fields you want. So, and how it works is that like we can actually just for simplicity, we can use the the command line tool at first to uh, create a trail DB. So uh, what you can do is that you can just create a test file, like a CSV file. And um, what you can do is that like you can actually, like for convenience, you can actually define the fields in the header of the CSV file. So you can say that my first column is the UUID, the second column is time, and then you, have, you can come up with some fields and, uh, and then you come up with some values for those fields. Um, I can show you how it could look like in practice. So, So if we had a file like this, a very simple file, you can actually use a different delimiter. So if you want to use commas, but I mean spaces work in this case. And what you can do now is that you can say TDP make, and you can give that file, like let's say test CSV. And now you can also um, say that like, okay, so this file includes a CSV header. So that first line, if you didn't have that, you could actually say fields, and then you could give the same list, but I mean, for convenience, if you know that you have that header, I mean, you don't have to do it. So you can just write CSV header, and um, then like uh, we can give it give it some name. I mean, did I specify some name here? Yeah, I guess my test. We can try that. Oh, of course. 
<clears throat> so, okay, so it, it created that, but I mean, do we know that it actually worked? So what we can do again is that we can do the dump thing and like we can see how it, how it looks like. Of course, it's not it's the, uh, my test. Right, and, um, and again, let's make it a bit prettier like this. So now you can see that magically that CSV file here transformed into these two events in TrailDB. So it works. I mean, not maybe very exciting, but that's the basic principle. The beauty of this is that uh, you could actually have like a really massive CSV file, and um, and this should be pretty efficient. So I mean, you can you can hopefully handle even like a gigabytes of data on your laptop without trouble, if not more. Um, and actually, like you can also define the inputs as like JSON objects. So oftentimes, let's say if you are using external web services or something like that to collect data, your data may be in JSON, and actually you can do the same make operation using JSON as well. So you can actually maybe find some guidance by just like looking at the TDP usage instructions. But okay, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so you need always you need UUID and time. They don't have to be the first field, so you can actually have any kind of, especially if you have JSON, I mean, it can be anything, and they don't have to be called that, but yes, you need to have some kind of a UUID and time, so. Um, okay. <clears throat> so now, I mean, hopefully, uh, we can both read trail DBs and, and create trail DBs using the command line. Um, well, now, of course, this is a Python conference, so uh, hopefully we can do something in Python. And actually, um, what you want to do next is that you want to install Python bindings, um, which come in, in a separate uh, repo. So like I mentioned, we have many different bindings, so the bindings are like maintained separately, so hence you have to kind of go through this extra step, so you can actually clone that uh, TrailDB Python. It's a very simple, it's actually like basically one file. Um, and it's, you use the normal setup.py to install it system-wide. Um, but I mean, you, you don't even have to do that if you don't want to install it system-wide. You just have to then set your Python path to point at the, at the TrailDB Python directory. And like I mentioned, um, this has been tested on, well, at least Python 2.7. I have no reason to believe that it wouldn't work on like 2.6 and uh, so forth. But, uh, there yeah, might be some like rough edges if you are using Python 3. I guess if you were using Python 3, you would be listening to the other tutorial most likely anyways. So. so um, I have done these steps previously, so I can just like show you that the once you have done the uh, GitHub cloning, you get this TrailDB Python, uh, and actually here's the that's basically the file that we care about. So the setup.py installs that to, to, um, to your like, uh, system paths, but I mean, you can just set Python path, like uh, something like this. TrailDB, Python, Python, and, and, and TrailDB, that should work um, if you don't want to install anything. So feel free to ask if you have any, any trouble with these steps. I, mean, I hope that it's pretty, pretty easy. So, um, okay, so now we can actually um, get to actual Python code. So now, I mean, in this very first example, which you can actually find in the examples directory of the, uh, of the Python repo, so you, you don't have to type it from the slide. You can actually just look at this file, um, and, and it's actually the same example that's also in the documentation at traildb.io. This example just basically creates something dumb and, and simple, um, similarity to the previous example with the CSV. So the important point here is that um, there are actually like two main objects in the Python binding. We have this thing called uh, TrailDB constructor, which is the, the thing you want to use when you are creating new TrailDBs, and then there's the TrailDB thing, which you want to use when you are opening existing stuff. And uh, I mean, it's really not, nothing too complicated, but a few things to keep in mind. First is that when you initiate this TrailDB constructor, you need to give it some name, which becomes the name of the file. You don't need to add the .tdb, just come up with some name. Um, and then kind of this defines the schema. So this is kind of the important part that like you need to basically announce in advance that like what uh, fields you want to have in your data. Now actually like maybe in contrast to kind of relational databases or and, and so forth. So, Actually, these fields uh, are like really pretty cheap. So, 
and like TrailDB works really, really well with sparse data, which oftentimes real time, uh, like a real world data is. So I mean, you don't have to feel bad about like just like adding a long list of fields and like even knowing that many of them will end up being empty or something like that. So they don't really add much overhead since basically that stuff gets compressed away. Um, so, but anyway, you have to come up with some list of fields in advance. Then in this example, that's it. So I mean, for this, that's it for this TrailDB. Yeah, it's kind of the immutability part. Yeah. Um, so the question was if you can change the fields later. But I mean, like for the for the one TrailDB, I mean, when you create it, you define the fields, and you can't change it for that later for that TrailDB later. So, but of course the Actually, uh, like what ends up happening in practice, I mean, just to give you some like a real world example, uh, we have like kind of like a one master trail DB at Adroll that we are using for many different use cases. And of course, over time, we have been actually like updating that thing. I mean, like kind of that, like, uh, like kind of a schema, let's say, um, like over the past two years. And like, of course, we, we always come up with new things we want to record. So we have been just adding them. And, uh, and and like we actually create these trail DBs at, the, at the kind of a daily cadence. So every every day we create a new trail DB. So basically, one at some point we just add new fields. And um, and then the previous ones in the history they didn't have this thing. Maybe we weren't collecting that piece of data before. But then they kind of at some point I mean this field appears. And then typically all queries I mean just notice that well, at some point in the past you can't just basically use that field. But I mean then you can add it add it at some point. Um, yeah. So I mean, in this case, we assume that like you don't have any any data. Of course, in practice, most often what you would be doing, let's say, even in your Python program, that you would be reading the data from some external source. Um, in this case, we assume that like we just generate some data on the fly. In this case, what we do is that we take, we come up with three users, we generate some like a random UUID for them using the UUID library in Python. Uh, we come up with some random username, and now I mean just kind of a, for, for the example's sake, we assume that these users are performing some actions. And in this case, let's say that they perform like three different actions. They open something, save something, and close something. And again, I mean, then we come up with some timestamps for these events, and, and then we add them in, in TrailDB by calling this uh, cons object cons add. And then we say that, okay, this thing is related to this UUID. Now, an important thing is that actually these don't have to be in order, so you could kind of a produce a stream of events like for different people, uh, like kind of producing data at different times in any, any order. So and, and TrailDB will go and sort them. Um, but I mean, in this example, I guess they are pretty much in order. And then the, um, the important interesting thing is that uh, when you are done adding stuff, you have to call this thing called cons finalize, which basically tells TrailDB that like now I'm done adding all events in this TrailDB, and now I'm done. And, and you can basically actually compress the data and, and create the file. So you always have to call this thing when you are not planning to add more events to this trail DB. In practice, again, I mean, what, what typically happens is that you, you may produce these things in kind of a batches or micro batches that you take, let's say, one hour worth of data and you create one trail DB, then you finalize it and then you start a new one. Or if you have a more like a static data set, you do it only once. So I can actually show you, I should have the, uh, I, I should have the same code here. I guess it like shows up quite nicely. Um, and now what happens, let's see if we can actually, I guess I was here before, so I can do this create. Yeah, no, I mean, it doesn't print anything, but I, I guess I was calling it tiny DDP, so I can see that like something got created. And now if we see what went inside, you can actually see that like the, the for loop, um, I mean, there, there was the random UUID, so the, 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 there's some like UUID, then we produce these like dummy timestamps, there, there are the usernames, and, um, and then the, these are the dummy actions. But now you have this like a beautiful, beautiful uh, like a trail DB containing different events for different users. And actually, as you can see in this output, um, kind of all uh, results related to a single user are, are like consecutive. So I mean, that's like ordered here, although they might not be ordered in the input itself. So that's how you can create stuff in Python, quite simple. So now, actually, like reading is, is maybe even simpler. So all you have to do is, yeah. That's correct, you can't. So basically what you want to do is that you can add a new constructor and like you can, but I mean, after you call finalize, you can't use that cons object anymore. Um, sorry? 
that's correct. You, yeah, the question is that like if you if you can like add stuff uh, in the in the trail DB or the constructor after you call finalize, and the answer is no, you can't, and and um, and you can't add later. So again, I mean the the idea is this, uh, like how how we end up using it is kind of a like append only thing that like you append these like a chunks of data. I'll be maybe talking about that a bit later, um, but um, but uh, yeah, I mean like for that chunk of data, I mean that's done and finalized. And so and the idea is that again, I mean the history doesn't change. So yeah, so about like reading. So I mean, the, the reading part is pretty simple. All you have to do is to import the trail DB object, and um, and then you say that okay, what's the thing you want to open? Uh, it's the kind of let's say our tiny thing, and then there is this uh, very convenient method called trails that actually gives you an iterator over all individual users or over all individual trails in the trail DB. And what it gives you is the UUID, and it gives you an iterator over the trail as well. So and then we can print this out. So let's see. I can again like. Um, oh, like this is the piece of code here, and um, and now let's see. Like when we execute, it looks actually like pretty ugly since uh, there's the UUID here, and I use the list so you can see that there are these like event um, tuples or name tuples actually in Python. Um, you can see that like for every event object, you have timestamp, you have again the username. And, and in this case, obviously, it's all um, grouped by, by, by the user. Like it's easier to see this way. So we have three users, and they have this trail of events. And uh, the, the really the kind of a one thing to note is that like why I called list there. So if we do this, um, and then we call it, you can actually see that like it gives you a, a cursor, so it's actually not a list of events, and this is actually an important point. Um, so by default, when I did the trails, uh, what it does is that it actually iterates over every trail in the trail DB. And uh, now imagine that if you had downloaded, let's say, the dump of the full Wikipedia history, I guess they have about like a 40 million different users. So uh, in Python, like really definitely what you don't want to do is to basically kind of a produce a list of like a 40 million users and like a list for every event. So basically, if you imagine that data is like a 5.8 gigabytes compressed, I mean, if you load it in Python, I mean, it would be uncompressed at least 10 times plus the Python overhead. So we would be talking about hundreds of gigabytes of, of heap that the that Python would be consuming. So that's not a good idea. But I mean, what, what you can do instead with TrailDB is that you can actually lazily kind of iterate over everything and like then you only like process the parts that you, you want uh, or you aggregate some summary statistics so you don't have to have like a massive amounts of memory to handle everything. So basically you can iterate over the different uh, trails and of course you can also iterate over individual trail so um, that's why you get the cursor and not the list of events so you can like basically lazily keep only interesting in the amount of data and of course you can use all the beautiful tools in Python like iter tools to slice and dice the, the different uh, the, the the trail in different ways. So, but I mean, it's all all like lazy lazy iterators that you get. Um, well, obviously, I mean, you don't have to always like uh, scan things through sequentially. You can also hop to an individual ID, and uh, how, how that works is that again, I mean, when you open uh, open the trail DB, you get the handle to TDB, and uh, now you can either look up things by kind of the row ID or the trail ID. So basically. If you have three rows, you have like basically zero, one, two. So you can you can basically say that I want this trail ID, and that's super fast operation. Um, but also, of course, if you know the UUID, and this may be more typical use case. Let's say you actually had a, like a like a web service um, using TrailDB, and like someone like makes an a API call and gives you a UUID and says that okay, I want things related to this guy. Then you would actually use this thing called um, thing called like get UUID to, to get that like. Um, oh, sorry. I mean, like you would actually like, like just like put the UUID here, um, and like you would, you would then like get the trail related to that UUID. Then actually, there's the operation that given the row ID gives you the UUID, and there's also a, like a convenient operation to, to check that like if a UUID exists in the trail DB. So you can you can like do that sanity check if you want, and. Uh, yeah, so this way basically you can you can hop to the rows that you you care about. Well, I mean, I'm I'm sure that you can imagine how it looks like, so maybe I don't need to show that. Then um, there are like some like a kind of a bookkeeping basic metadata operations like that you need. So you can imagine that you occasionally you want to see the fields. You can do that. 
If you do len and TDB, what you get is you get the number of trails, basically the number of rows or number of users in the trail DB. You can get like a minimum and maximum timestamps in the trail DB by calling time range. If you do parse time, it actually gives you date time objects in Python and not the Unix timestamps. And uh, like one thing that's like really convenient oftentimes is that um, you can use these lexicon operations to actually see uh, distinct unique values for different fields. So you can ask that, okay, so if I have the username field, what are the, um, like, well, I mean, first, how many distinct usernames I have? And also, I mean, you can actually iterate over all users that exist in this trail DB. So, and, uh, well. Yeah, that's separate, so that, don't, right. So I guess here, so these are the, the operations, and let's see. So I guess like these are the fields. Uh, the next one is the number of trails. Then we have the, the first timestamp and the last timestamp. And then we have, let's see. Actually, interestingly, this is actually a good point. So, so when, when I do the, um, the lexicon size, um, it actually gives you four. And like these are like for the, the username. But they actually like, you can see only three usernames. So, uh, there's always a special like a null or empty value. So like I mentioned, I mean oftentimes data is sparse. So there's like for every field you have um, uh, like the, the empty string as a special case. So in that sense, I mean the, the, like you can see like a three non-empty usernames plus the empty one which is not listed here. So you, it says four. So those are the basic kind of a metadata operations. Um, so actually now kind of getting to something more interesting. So um, of course, if you consider it like a normal database usage, what you do with like uh, relational databases, like almost never you scan through the whole database, but you actually are interested only in the subset of events, let's say. So like you do select something where, and that where clause is actually what you can do with the event filters. So you can get only a subset of filters. And um, in the interest of time, maybe I will kind of go quickly through the idea. So. What you can do is that basically you can actually define a Boolean query. So you can say in this case, you can have a very simple case that like you say that, okay, give me only um, events that have action open. And then it gives you only those events. But I mean, like I mentioned, I mean, this is actually look supporting uh, kind of actual like a Boolean queries that are expressed in this like a conjunctive normal form, which means that you can do also unions. You can say that like action equals open or action equals close, but that's like or. Um, and um, then you can obviously do ands as well. And uh, if you actually like kind of look closely, the point is that like one list here is basically like one union. And then if you give it two lists, so in this case you have two separate lists in a list, um, then basically it's a kind of a list of unions that are separated by and, and it's kind of the idea of the conjunctive normal form. Um, and uh, so you can basically construct a query in a pretty kind of a uh, like a, a concise format like this. I can, and then lastly, I mean, you can of course do negations. The negations maybe it looks kind of a bit funny maybe, but the idea is that like there's this flag called like is negative and you can say that yes, I, this guy is negative. So you can just say that it should be true. So I can like just quickly maybe show you. So again, um, let's take, I guess that's the simple case. Let's say, let's say the union. So it's the same guy, so we, we are interested only in the events that are related to action open or action close. Um, and now if we, if we look at this, maybe actually it might be easier if we don't print the UUID, not that relevant here. So you can see that like there are only opens and close, and like, I guess we had to save event as well, so it gives you gives you only those events. And like, well, I mean, of course, again, this might not seem like much, but actually what's really important about this desperately in terms of Python is that this is implemented in the C library itself. So um, instead of you doing this in Python, you can kind of offload this rather kind of a maybe expensive operation to, to the library and it, it actually only get the data in Python that you want to analyze. Again, I mean, to the point that that uh, you, you kind of, uh, Python is of course not very performant, so you want to minimize the data you want to handle on that side. So uh, now actually this is um, maybe the kind of the most exciting part. So um, I showed you before that visualization um, uh, that was created using, using uh, Adrol's data. You can actually like do that by yourself right now. Um, 
it's actually like really, really cool. And, and why it is so cool is that actually there's this very nice um, package in the, in the Anaconda ecosystem called Data Shader. Um, I highly recommend taking a look. There's a like really nice presentation about Data Shader and why it is useful. And um, it's actually especially a very good match for something like TrailDB that allows you to handle large amount of data very easily. So, so um, I guess like there was some instruction that you should have Anaconda installed on your laptop uh, before you came here. So there are actually instructions for that. And given that this is kind of conference is closely related to the, the whole like a, uh, like a NumPy ecosystem or like a PyData ecosystem. So if you haven't done it yet, there will be many opportunities to do that later. But if you have it, so you can do just Conda install pandas and data shader. And um, in the interest of time, um, I can just like a quickly give you an example. I mean, this is, this is all there is to this example. And um, so what we are doing here is that we are using, the, using the, the Wikipedia example that I gave you earlier. And um, the, again, I mean, the Wikipedia was about the edits done on Wikipedia. And what we are doing in this case, actually, it's a fun little example, um, is that unfortunately, as you may know, I mean, like the, the artist Prince died last April, I guess. And, um, and of course, there's a page about Prince in Wikipedia. And, and like we might be interested in knowing how like Prince's um, kind of popularity has changed over time and like how, how his death might show up in Wikipedia. Since, of course, as you can imagine, every time something big happens in the world, I mean, people rush to update Wikipedia. So what we can do is that we can actually um, use the event filter to say that, okay, give me only actions that are related to the Prince's Wikipedia page in the, in the, in the trail DB. Um, and then in this case, we are basically um, like iterating over every, every user, assuming that maybe they have done something related to Prince. I mean, we are only taking the Prince related events. And then like for every event, we are actually like, in this case, yielding the, the time of the first event and then the events themselves. By the way, I mean, you can find this example also in the TrailDB Python repo under data shader example. And, um, and then what we are doing with this data is that we are like taking, uh, basically creating this array of, of points. So we have like a X axis, uh, X axis and we have Y axis and the X axis is again time. We normalize the time by the first timestamp in the database. And then the Ys are, are basically just the, the user ID. So it's just basically like every row get, gets its own sequential ID. And then in th this case, we actually want to have like two different types. So we, like I mentioned, I mean, Wikipedia allows both anonymous and like uh, registered edits. So it, we have two types, so anonymous or registered. And then like once we have these X and Y points, we can actually add them in a pandas data frame. So data shader operates on, on pandas data frames. So we uh, add the X and Y there, and then we also add this like la last categorical column in pandas here. Um, and then we return the whole data frame from this get data frame thing. And then this is actually the data shader part. So what the data shader does is that it allows you to basically kind of build this massive, like, a, well, they are not quite scattered plots, but basically plot your data in, 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 a, in a very kind of a, like a raw format. And then it takes care of actually uh, rendering the points um, in such a way that like it tries to kind of a, uh, make the data, uh, like, uh, still, I mean, like, kind of uh, retain the kind of the important aspects of data. Since, like I mentioned in, the, in my earlier example, we had about 200,000 users, basically 200,000 points kind of uh, on the on the y-axis, but obviously the, the, the image itself wasn't like a 200,000 pixels. So, kind of, uh, you, have to, you have to do some, like, um, uh, sampling there, and that's what Data Shader does for you. And then we are also saying that, like, we map these anonymous users to red color and the, and the users to the blue color, and then we output that to a PNG. And actually, like what it will look like is, is this. So you can see that like you have um, users again on the, on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And interestingly, well, I mean, the, this is since the, the beginning of Wikipedia, so I guess the, the timestamp is something like 2000 something. And, and this is actually April here, or April, May here. And actually, interestingly, what you can see is that um, most of the activity on the Princess page happened I don't know, maybe around like uh, 2005 to 2010, something like that. Maybe if one of you is, is, is a fan of his, you may know that maybe he was publishing more recordings at that time or something more exciting happened. So there was a lot, a lot of activity there. And you can see that there are lots of red dots corresponding to uh, anonymous edits and some uh, like blue kind of uh, stripes, meaning that there were some like maybe dedicated fans who kept editing the page over time. And then like what's really curious is that then you see this line here, which is when he died. 
So you see that like there was like kind of a rush of edits happening exactly on the same day on the page when everybody came in and, and wanted to chime in, I guess. So that's that's pretty interesting view to the data. Um, still, again, I mean, you see the same effect that um, it kind of looks like a big cl cloud of dots. What you can do is that um, you can just add this like one little thing here, which basically says that like since we output the first edit time here, uh, we can actually just call sort it, and it sorts by this thing here, and uh, and basically meaning that like let's sort the rows of the visualization by the time of the first edit, and uh, let's. I don't just have it in the reverse order. So this, this small modification, but the visualization looks way more interesting. So now what you can see here is that like early on when Wikipedia wasn't that popular, I mean there wasn't that much activity. I mean maybe for the for like the first some years, some Prince fans created some pages, but really little activity. Then at some point, what started happening is that there was like lots and lots of like anonymous users making edits. So you see this like red stuff and the, then the blue guys as well doing stuff over time. And interestingly, at some point, uh, the I guess, I don't know exactly how the dynamics of Wikipedia work, but at some point they stopped the anonymous edits, so the red dots stopped totally. And of course, since most of the edits were anonymous, I mean, then the kind of the, 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 the volume of edits decreased also quite a lot. And now, when you actually look at this, you see that the edits that, like in the previous visualization, was kind of hard to see that, like, how many people actually created these edits. It's kind of easier to see that, like, it's actually, well, I mean, first, I mean, what is really noticeable here is that these guys who actually made the edits on the, on the, on the day of death actually hadn't made that many edits before, so which means that they were actually new users who just knew that some, like, a notable person died and they wanted to make the edits, but they really didn't care about Prince that much. Well, it's kind of sad. Although, I mean, there are some, like, dedicated fans who also made some edits, so. But, I mean, there's, like, a lot of information condensed in this visualization, and all it took is, is this, like, a kind of a, maybe 30 lines of code. So again, I mean, like, um, you can definitely like play with all kinds of things here. I mean, change the colors to, and of course, by all means, I mean, especially if you take the full dump of the whole Wikipedia history, there's like a tremendous amount of uh, exploration that you can do there. So that's, that's very cool. And I know that we are like kind of running short in time. So let me just quickly touch some uh, kind of uh, uh, more advanced topics. So one is about performance. So obviously, like if you especially consider that the full Wikipedia example of 600 million events and like 40 million users, I mean, like you are really kind of a stretching the limits of Python. That's really a lot of data. But I, although, I mean, the TrailDB by itself is something that fits in RAM. So there are like a few performance tricks that you can do while still using Python. Uh, well, I mean, just to give you an idea, um, so basically how TrailDB works internally is that like every field has that like a lexicon set of values that are stored in a, in a separate place. And, um, but what's really important is that actually internally it handles everything as integers, so which are called items. And one item is actually a combination of one field and one value. So these are the items in, in TrailDB internally. And in contrast to many other databases, TrailDB actually doesn't hide these internal details totally, since they are really important in performance point of view. So we actually have a set of functions in the Python binding that allow you to convert back and forth between the strings and integers. And, and why this is important is that, um, well, first, internally, I mean, like, it's, it's way more efficient to handle just integers than strings, especially since, in the case of TrailDB, the strings can be any binary data. You can even store images or UTF-8, whatever. So it's kind of a complicated topic, strings overall. But uh, more importantly, um, it's actually, like, just way more efficient even in Python to handle integers than strings. So let's say that you wanted to know that like what are the most common pages in Wikipedia. So I mean now this is actually like the, maybe the simplest way of doing it. Um, oh. So you open the trail DB, you have the counter object in Python, that's very convenient. You just iterate over every single trail, every single event, you add all the titles in the counter and the counter has the nice like a most common operation so it gives you the top five titles in, in, in Wikipedia, super nice. But the problem is that it actually has to, of course, the titles are strings. So now you can imagine that like every time you just like count like one event, you have to kind of take the string. And honestly, I mean, for counting the statistics, it doesn't make a difference if you are using strings or integers. So actually, it is way more efficient to do the statistics um, based on the integers. Like in this case, you can do that by saying row items equals true. And you basically collect the statistics using integers. And then only in the end, once you have the top five, you convert them to strings. You get exactly the same output, but the fact is that it's all, all, all almost uh, all, over twice as fast as the string version. So it's kind of a, like a, something that 
something that like we kind of uh, want to make things easy with Python, like this is of course a super easy version, but I mean occasionally you kind of want to do a bit more to make it like a lot faster, and then this is kind of way how you can do it. There are actually like many other things, um, like really lots of things we are really concerned about performance because of size of our data. Um, so there's in the documentation you can find this like a performance best practices, which gives you all kinds of tri uh, tricks, especially for lower level languages, how to make things fast. So that's that. And now as the, the last topic, I want to touch, yeah. I have to touch the question of, um, of overall architecture. So this is gonna be super quick. We can actually talk about this later maybe. So I mean one which we touched already is the question of sharding. So especially if you have a continuous data stream, what do you want to do is that like you want to um, keep creating trail DBs as, uh, over time. You kind of append new trail DB. What we do is that we do it every day. So you can start it by time. But also, I mean, you can start it by users. So another like a good use case is that you just like maybe use some hashing function to decide that these users go to this side and these users go to the other side. Or it could be based on any other field as well. Or you can do both, actually. You can have like a whole matrix of things, which is convenient if you have a lot of data. Um, then another big question, I guess someone asked that already, is about like uh, uh, how, how do you actually do this in a distributed setting? Or of course, you can't do everything in your, in, on your laptop. Um, so. Well, I mean, first, one thing that like we really think is, is totally undervalued in the big data community is how much you can do on a single server. So and there are like, like really like innumerable number of benefits in, in just like using a single server. I mean, one of them is that it's just super productive and easy to debug and like easy to develop on and, and all that stuff. So this is actually like, a, like an example from like one massive like a machine learning test that we are performing using TrailDP at that role. What we do is that, um, this is a single server, like a D28X large is a massive server with 244 gigs of RAM and uh, I guess like a 40 terabytes of disk, uh, 48 spinning disk, so it's, it's perfect for sequential I.O. What you can do is that you spend some time downloading trail DBs from S3, then um, you actually have a, like a multi-threaded or, or like multiple uh, processes processing the data, so um, you do the processing, well actually here like you like read the uh, trail DBs in memory, then you do the processing and then when you are done, you upload the results in S3. And this is actually like not taking too long. This is a single server. It's actually very convenient. And, uh, and like especially when you have a multi-core server, given that like TrailDPs are immutable, it's very easy to do multi-core. You just open a TrailDP handle in every, let's say you can use a multi-processing module in, in Python or you have multiple threads. So keep that in mind. I mean, oftentimes you don't need actually a cluster of machines. However, uh, like one, actually there's a separate presentation that we have given about this, so I don't, I, I don't spend too much time on this, but really, I mean, Adrol is actually using AWS for everything, so the whole business runs on AWS, so of course, when we design TrailDP, we really design it in, in AWS in mind, and how it works in our case is that, like, we have a, a separate master data store, which is actually also in S3, where we just, like, dump these basic log files, like CSV, um, then we have a, a process that like produces trail DBs given these log files and the trail DBs are dumped in Amazon S3. And, and now what is really, really nice is that like Amazon S3 is like one of the, the greatest things ever built by the humankind. So it's massively scalable, really reliable. So what you can do is that you can have an arbitrary number of consumers then taking the trail DBs from S3 and performing different kind of computation on the trail DBs. And this is a really, really nice and robust and scalable architecture. And like one thing to notice here is that we really don't have to ever worry about the size of your database cluster or the expense of your queries or anything like that. Because all you have to do is basically scale the number of machines based on the, on the type of the computation you want. And then you just copy the trail DPs to as many places as you need. And um, how we do this at that role, there's a separate presentation. Um, Actually, like we define this like a data dependency graph using using this Python package called Luigi. There has been actually a nice presentation about this at PyData before. Um, we have a blog article and number of presentations about this, so feel free to go to our tech.atroll.com. You can find articles about this. And, and we package these different data processing jobs as Docker containers, and then we have a nice auto-scaling group that basically gives us as many spot instances, as many machines as we happen to need to perform the computation. So all in all, what you get is this like basically elastically scalable, like unlimitedly scalable uh, computation environment where you can like define your jobs as, as simple Docker containers, I mean, which means that you can use any language. Some jobs are in Python. We even have jobs written in R in production. Some things are written in C. I mean, it all works beautifully um, in, in, in concert. 
and, uh, and they all like fetch data from S3, they perform the computation and they put the data results back in S3. And then we have a simple job scheduler that like just like keeps like uh, running running the computation. So and because of spot instances, it's actually surprisingly cost effective. So we can we can talk about more about this later. So so okay. So this was pretty much the, the kind of the tutorial. I mean, one thing that I want to mention is that this is an open source project. I mean, there is a kind of a small community on on the Jitter, So feel free to join us there. Um, this is some like a list of ideas. I actually even mentioned the Python three here. That you could you could do with TrailDP. Well, I mean, it's totally up to you. This is open source, so I mean, come with your own ideas. Um, um, but I mean, yeah, there are like all kinds of interesting things people have started doing with it. And um, of course, like most importantly, I mean, like feel free to use it in production. And uh, yeah, it actually works well for us. Hopefully, it works well for you. And uh, I guess that's it. Thank you.